it doesn't hurt to be obsessive about things to that extent. It's really confusing for your brain because you don't know where your legs are. I, I, I do a lot of gesticulation. I, you, know. you want to be able to grab the ground like a nice pair of boobs. I will certainly try and apply that. Yo, 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 what's going on guys? Reese here from More Than Lifting. This is the More Than Lifting podcast with my good friend Chris Thatcher. I'm not going to let him say hi today. I'm just going to keep going. Uh, today we're talking about loads of fun stuff. Um, I want, really want to talk about deloading actually, Chris, at one point. That's how fun it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about not training. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's pretty much the theme since we've got off our, uh, our main kind of pillar subjects. I'm in it, like... Yeah, no, it's true. It's something we haven't really talked about. Well, we've talked about periodization and, and training cycles. Yeah, whatnot, yeah. But, but I don't think we've gone into deloading and, quite as much. No, no, we haven't gone into any depth really about uh, cyclical training. We've just mentioned about sometimes having to do a strength one before you can work on some skills. And yep. uh, that actually brings us on to other thing, another thing I want to talk about today, uh, which is actual training the skills. I said about it yes uh, last week, yeah, and then we didn't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, well, so right at the standard, beginning, we yeah. talk about everything else and then actually miss the point of the episode. So that's cool. We can start there. Let's try and be more concise today if but, we can. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we're not going to talk for very long. We got a fifteen-minute podcast lined up, and no, it'll probably be about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it does yeah. seem to come in about that sort of length normally, doesn't it? But, you know, I've, I do have things to do this afternoon, so perhaps we can keep it short. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure we can keep it We can keep it down. We can keep it down. Um, I also we, want to apologise, right, because the last episode, I, I was a bit, like, bunged up, and I had a bit of a cold, and I was, like, coming just out the back end of it, and I was feeling a bit, mm, and I, like, I, I just wasn't very enthusiastic at the start of the episode, so sorry about that, guys. I do love this shit, and uh, I won't be slacking anymore <laughs> i don't think you could be accused of slacking i don't think it was that bad oh okay cool in that case let's get lazy so deloading lazy is deloading before we get on actually what what uh, have you been up to, have you been out doing anything crazy any funny stories going on mate um i'm trying to think what's this week entailed not a great deal i don't think um, no, it's actually, you know, just been getting ready for Christmas, you know, winding down a little bit, working on different things for my new website and coaching program that I'm yeah. launching in the new year. How is so, Christopher Thatcher coming along? ChristopherThatcher.com is coming along very well. And I had a very uh, inspiring and productive conversation with my web developer, who is a very talented man by the name of Jamie Dumont. Hi, Jamie, just sexy Jamie. Jamie. Yo, sexy Jamie. Shout outs to Jamie. Hey guys, if you like uh, have websites and stuff, get to Jamie. Jamie yeah. will help you out. Jamie will help you out. Well, I, I know he's a very busy guy, um, but yeah, I'm sure he'll do his best to help you out. So look, uh, look up his company, Tactically Creative. And, yeah, um, I'll stick yeah, a uh, link in the show notes. Yeah, because he's a, he's a fantastic guy and a very very good developer and a very um, gifted designer as well, which makes life a lot simpler because. You know, he does all the sort of logos and, and general design bits and pieces for the site, as well as actually building the, the main body of it as well. So that does make things far easier in terms of general workflow and organisation. But yeah, no, so we had a good chat. Older Jamie. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Speak to Jamie. Uh, we had a good chat. We got a lot done. It was very productive. We put the world to rights at the same time, which is quite cool. So yeah, all that's good. But yeah, it's just really winding down till, till Christmas. And then getting ready for uh, my trip to New York over New Year, which I'm very excited about as well. Oh, yeah. Are you planning on getting a limousine and getting stuck in traffic? <laughs> no, don't be silly. No, it's going to be a lot of walking around and, uh, yeah, just kind of trying to soak up the, the general vibe of Manhattan, really, because, and Brooklyn. I've never been to Brooklyn before, so I'm looking forward to going over and spending a day there, just sort of mooching about. Apparently, it's very uber trendy at the moment, lots of vegan restaurants and uh, cool little coffee shops. Well, that'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be great. And given that I've done a lot of the sites of New York previously, I'm not so concerned about doing that overly touristy trip. We just want to kind of take in, as I say, the general sort of culture and vibe of the city and just get a feel for different things and not be too rushed. You know, I think when especially we go on relatively short trips to cities, you end up running around trying to squeeze loads of different things in and not allowing any time just to kind of be. So we're very um, intent on making that the emphasis of the trip this time around. 
All right, awesome. I think I think going around and exploring places is cool anyway, to be honest with you. Like whenever I go away, uh, I cringe at like going and doing uh, tourist sh touristy shit. I just want to like, like we went to Lake Como and we uh, we stayed around the, the north side in a little village and like we just spent the week like walking around in the mountains and like going down to the lake and that like, was amazing. I love holidays like that. I don't, I'm not mm. a big like, oh, let's go to the museum. <laughs> well, I think there's certain things you have to do in certain places. Like you can't, I don't think you can go to Rome, for example, for the first time in your life and not go to the Colosseum and not go to the Forum and not see, you know, the real key sites in that city. There yeah, but I think I'd limit do, it but... to like one or two or th three maybe if it's uh, like, you know, a big one. But I'm, ultimately, I'm not really that interested in doing like a guided tour of the oh, no. local graveyard or anything like that you know it's it's uh, it's a bit too much for me and that i'm just uh, i feel like i like to get a bit more integrated do you know what i mean i like to mm. like, wander around and like, chat with people and stuff yeah it's much much more fun for me well, it depends on the nature of where you're going you know we i really love going to madeira for example you know it's not a real tourist spot in the sense that there's lots to see there. It's just a really cool place to hang out and you know enjoy living the island culture and the island life for a while. Yeah. And go and hang out in restaurants and coffee shops and just mooch around chatting to people and just soaking up the sort of general relaxing atmosphere of, of that way of life. You know, we could you can hire a car and drive around the island and go up into the mountains and see various different ancient artifacts here and there, but that's not necessarily why you're going somewhere There's like a gold that. vase just sitting on the side of the road. Exactly. <laughs> just, but if you go, you know, you go somewhere like it's a major city, you know, that's got some really cool historical stuff to, to go and check out, then, yeah, of course, you want to go and see that. Mm. But also realise that maybe you are going to go back there at some point in your life, so you don't have to necessarily squeeze it all in in one go. Yeah, yeah, just take it easy. Yeah, man. And, yeah, oh. we'll, we'll go to Bulgaria and do exactly that at some point because, yeah yeah as we said in our last episode that seems to be where we're getting quite a lot of listens the Bulgarian <laughs> the workshop the show, so. it's come in yeah it'll happen yeah, it's in um in Sofia like which I believe is the capital yeah so, yeah cool definitely be out there at some point awesome well yeah cool it sounds like you've been up to a lot I think that's uh, uh, New York for New Year's that'd be quite exciting as well yeah I think so it'd be Good. nice to have a, a few days at Christmas just to sort of unwind and spend time with family what have you got planned um, I'm, I'm, uh, I got some family coming down. That's about it, really. I, uh, I don't really have anything planned for the year. The only thing I've got planned for the new year is launch, relaunching the, um, the, the program. That, oh, actually, this is the ideal time to talk about it. <laughs> oh, funny how you just segued into that so casually. <laughs> no, no, that was a total accident, but it, it worked quite nicely. So Yes, that was so organic and natural. <laughs> oh, fuck you, man. <laughs> 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 That's literally all I've all I've got. I've got. I'm not. I'm not got any plans for New Year's yet. So, okay. So, so you, you'll you'll just be sitting in in front of your laptop. No, I've been working towards that now. Ah. Uh, and then at New Year, you know, I'll probably probably find something to do. You know, but I'm not. Yeah. I'm not plan out. I'm not plan on going out like crazy raving or anything like that. That's all. Um, I'm not going to New York either. I'm not going off on holiday. Like you've got all this shit planned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's a, it's an exception to be away at New Year. I normally stay at home or spend time with friends or family or something. So this was kind of a let's go do something a special year. So yeah. I thought we'd do something different. Cool. Well, yeah, I've been working on the program anyway. Cool. And uh, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. So guys, if you uh, if you want to get started, if you want to get into a bit of calisthenics training. New Year, ideal time for everyone to get their fitness goals back in. Everyone slacks over Christmas and stuff. You know, we all do it. It's understandable. So New Year's, if you want to uh, to sort yourself out, because you're all lazy. You're all as lazy as me and Chris anyway. And we're, as you can tell, we're both really lazy. So, uh, yeah, so come. you can get on the website. We, I'm going to do a couple of Facebook Lives over the, uh, over the course of uh, the next few weeks leading up to it so I can give you some Q&As about what the course is. But it's basically get started, get stuck in, build a bit of strength, lose a bit of weight, uh, get started with the skills, some basic progression exercises that will get you ready to take on all the crazy stuff like front levers and the back levers and the muscle-ups, you know. Um, that's it. 
28 days, very, very simple, all delivered by email. There's videos, uh, course walkthroughs like, for all of the, uh, all the workouts. I've got a little bit of coaching thing. I've got uh, weekly live Q&As that are gonna be going on as well. And if you want, I've got the option to have one-on-one -on -one time with me too to guide you through the whole process do a little program adjustments, etc. So that's it. I'm only throwing it in brief now because I want to talk about other stuff. But if you want to check that out, um, it'll just be go on uh, morethanlifting.com slash 28 transformation. And, uh, and yeah, you can see it all there. That'll be all the info there. So uh, check that out. That's it, Chris. I will stop talking about it. Let's talk about deloading for a bit, shall we? Sounds good, mate. So... I've, like I said uh, last time, I, I've kind of come out to the end of my uh, strength cycle. It's gone on a bit longer than I thought. I've ca just carried on. I haven't spent the time doing my deload, which is basically a deload for anyone who doesn't know. It's like the week between your cycles. You have a little bit of a break. You ease off on the training or do little to none just to give your body a time to recover from training heavy and almost overtraining because uh, I have been pushing it a bit for the weeks previous to that. So that, that's the whole point of it. You need time to recover and uh, that at the end of a cycle is the ideal time to let your body recover, grow a bit, get some good rest, you know, and then you start the next phase stronger than you were before rather than going and going and going until you're injured and then having to stop and actually going back. Agree 100%. It's a great time to do prehab and rehab based work. So if you've got any sort of parts of your body that you feel maybe need a little bit more of attention because they're getting a bit tight as one of my shoulders is currently at the moment. So, you know, that's going to be my first priority when I have a deload week myself with my own training is to kind of spend a bit more time doing some extra mobility, some stretching, um, you know, invest in, in a massage as well. You know, that can be great. You know, use it as time spent fully regenerating or fully supporting the the regeneration of your body and your tissue you know connective or lean mass whatever it might be and you know spend a bit more time on the foam roller do some extra mobility drills and then in terms of the actual loading the actual strength component of any of the work you're doing make it more maintenance based you know very or you can make it skill based although a, a much lower intensity than you would otherwise you know just keep yourself ticking over you know i think there's a lot of people that might see a deload week as an opportunity to slack off to not do anything at all and just remember you know for a variety of reasons there are going to be plenty of weeks in the year where that can just happen naturally whether it's through sickness holiday work commitments family commitments doesn't matter you know it's always it's always good i think to look at your year as a complete cycle and assume that much like people do with their employment contracts you know they know they've got four weeks of holiday a year i think you can always allow for that it's probably going to be up to if not even more so depending on your, your circumstances of four weeks where you may be not able to train at all. So that's a week every quarter where you may not be able to, or the equivalent of a week every quarter where you can't do anything because you're so constrained by, as I say, sickness, time, you know, not being as, as readily available as it otherwise is, or just other, you know, major commitments or, you know, because life will happen. Mm. That's the reality that we all face. So if you factor that in, then when you can still put in those deload weeks, don't use those as your deload weeks. You know, make sure deloading is still a structured part of the cycle, but just make sure that you don't completely switch off and go, right, well, yeah, I'll just do a couple of sessions this week and, and pull the right the way back because I'm deloading, so it doesn't matter if I'm resting. You know, deloading can still be done at home. You can stretch, you can roll. As I say, prehab and rehab-based work, so a little bit of attention to, to joints and tissue that maybe need a little bit more of extra TLC because of the effort you've been putting them through in the previous cycle. So just bear that in mind. I think it's always very prudent to, to consider that there'll be time to have complete time off. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But when it comes to actually deloading, make sure that's still a structured part of the cycle as much as you possibly can. Yeah, definitely. It's not an excuse to just sit down and eat burgers all the time because you're resting or deloading and it sounds kind of technical and interesting that's just you being lazy and actually the risk you run or that i find that uh, you can run with deloading is that if you don't do like some kind of mobility or like handstands all the time for the week or whatever just to keep you in the zone and in the training site and like the mode it, you can just throw it all away and, and not go back for the second cycle. You have to start all over again. It's a nightmare. <laughs> well, it's amazing. Even when it's such a, and we, we both know this well, you know, we've trained 
for the majority of our adult lives, you know, in some discipline or another, it's always been a structured part, as we've talked about before, of, of both of our lives. But it, it, even for us, it doesn't take much to get out of the, the rhythm, out of the flow, as I've said about my own training more recently. You yeah, know, you miss happens, a week or two, yeah. it, it, can, it can really throw you. You know, the motivation can drop, you know, psychologically, as much as you may want to be in the gym, actually getting yourself up and out to do it and not saying, oh, well, I'll just do it tomorrow, I'll, I'll start on Monday. You know, you get to Wednesday of the week and think, well, this week's done now. You know, what's the point of starting? So I'll just start next week. You know, we're all still fallible as human beings. So no matter how much progress, how into it, it becomes an integral part of your routine, it's still possible to fall off if you don't keep yourself ticking over at the very least. So it is still really important, not just from a physiological point of view, but from a psychological point of view, to keep yourself in the rhythm of getting up, going to the gym, or you know, if you're doing stuff at home, getting up and actually getting something done and keeping that, that structure and that rhythm to the work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really important. It's so easy just to kind of fall, fall off the wagon and your deload is the ideal time to kind of just let it ease off yeah so, it's it, amazing really isn't it it's like with nutrition it really doesn't take much for anyone no matter you know i've spoken to guys who are you know elite level competitors in you know particularly like bodybuilding and you know figure athletes and people like that who are so crazily disciplined you know they're really they're measuring out macros and calories down to like the absolute wire you know everything everything is planned and structured to the finest detail because that's what you have to do to to compete at that level and it really you know they'll be the first to admit that you know a couple of days of bad eating they'll have like a cheat day and then the cheat day rolls into two cheat days <laughs> and then a cheat week and you know all of a sudden it can slip very very quickly now you might argue that because they're so restrictive the rest of the time it's almost like their i don't know their subconscious or their limbic brain just kind of bites back and just goes right no you've, you've pushed me down you've controlled me for too long like we talked about before they haven't let the chimp roam around yeah, you know, yeah. Let him out of his cage you know they've been kind of keeping him locked away and you know that can be dangerous so i can see the argument there but the, the point is it's possible for anyone to fall off the wagon whether it's with the movement the nutrition meditation's another great thing you know yeah. people like to <clears throat> talk about cultivating a mindfulness practice specifically meditation now and i know this myself i can go for weeks where I'm really into it and really focused one week of for whatever reason just reprioritizing things and realizing I don't have time first thing in the morning to, to sit and, and do that and that's a ridiculous point because you always have time for even five or ten minutes but yeah <laughs> for whatever reason you convince yourself otherwise because other things are demanding of your attention and your time and again that's part of a mindfulness practice to try and make sure that doesn't become the case but it can happen so across the board you know every facet of human life you know all the good things all the things that are giving you the greatest return you know that 20 percent that's giving you the 80 percent benefit in your life all of those things if left unattended and you know the the focus slipping just enough away from them for anyone i don't care who you are all the way whether you're tony robbins the dalai lama it doesn't matter we're all human beings we all are still subject to the similar to similar failings yeah and that's just the reality of it so don't ever think you're untouchable some people are going to be stronger than others but we're all susceptible to that happening so whatever it may be just keep keep the rhythm going keep the machine churning and uh, yeah keep yourself ticking over because it's so important but as you were saying deloading very very important absolutely vital not just as i say for the psychological stuff but as you were saying rightly before to give your body a real chance to just regenerate and rest and recover and make sure that for the next cycle you're going to come back stronger rather than just hammering yourself hard week after week after week and eventually just breaking down anyway well yeah and that's that's kind of uh, the point i've got to where i because i haven't really been taking it easy i've been pushing this and i've been pushing this i built into my strength bit and then i, I was kind of slowly bringing in more and more skill-based work as i was going through the course and uh, now I've got to the point where I've like I've already kind of started my skill cycle, but I haven't really had a rest either. And from doing so much pommel, uh, that mushroom stuff, I, I, I need to get. Well, you'll see that video. But from doing so much stuff on the mushroom as well, like after session and everything else, the gymnastics, I've ended up hurting my forearm. Not not like a, not, it's not an injury. It's just like it's more than DOMS. It's like a full on. Ache. Like, it feels like it's between my bones, do you know what I mean? It's like somewhere in the middle, like right up against them. 
and it's uh, just from having to stabilize myself w with all that momentum on the on the mushroom and mm. d doing it at the kind of towards the end of this cycle where my muscles are generally a bit more fragile because they've just so beaten up and soft <laughs> yeah definitely you just as I said, just that blurring the lines too much and trying to sort of get into the next cycle before you've really had a chance to wind down from the last one, you know, it, it can yeah. be hugely detrimental. Don't be wrong, you can blag it to an extent, but mm. it's all about being optimal, isn't it, in, in what you're doing in terms of your output. Yeah. So, you know, just trying to have that, I think, again, psychologically, physiologically, great to have that clean cut off and say, right, this is, you know, think of it in terms of, you're, you're a fan of like the 12-week uh, the year concept, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, basically chunking everything down and having almost a review, you know, looking back over the previous cycle and saying, right, well, you know, not only am I just deloading now, but I'm using this as an opportunity to kind of find out what I've learned, you know, focus on the good things that have come from that cycle, the, the bigger challenges, the struggles, you know, the things that maybe weren't quite as on point as I wanted them to be. You know, it's a good opportunity to kind of just check into that and set very clear intentions for what the next cycle is going to be rather than this sort of very gentle blurring of the two yeah and that that's exactly the issue i've been going through so what i've done this week is i've left off i've i've still been at gymnastics because they the club's going to be closing up for christmas monday it's going to be my last session so i've needed to go down there just to get my training in at some point so i can use the rings and stuff but this week i haven't really done well since about saturday i haven't, I haven't done any training so saturday sunday Monday and Wednesday are gymnastics, but Tuesday and uh, oh, I haven't done anything. And today I'll probably just mess around with some handstands and stuff at home and uh, and something like that. You know, I'm not going to go particularly heavy. And then mm. now, like, I'll, I might go down, like, go do something Friday, but it'll only be light. It's really just to use the solar and steam down the, uh, down the gym or something because I quite fancy it. Mm. Um, but yeah, and then you always fancy it. I know. Yeah, it's nice, man. You know. <laughs> no, it is. I, I I factor that in to my my training time. Particularly, well, I train in a couple of different places, but the one that has the pool and the steam room and, and sauna and everything. You know, I make sure that there's a, I allow for a two hour block of time, which is anywhere from pretty an hour and up to an hour and fifteen generally for training. And then the rest of the time is just, as I say, tra traveling yeah. to and from the gym. And then the rest is in the pool for a few lengths just to stretch out a little bit and then basically lay on my back in a very hot room for about half an hour, which is quite nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm exactly the same. Like if I'm going down to do some uh, training down the gym, then uh, it's it's a two hour ordeal. And I, and I won't do any training for about for more than like 40, 45 minutes. Mm. It's a good bit of time just sitting there usually chat and there's some old old guys who come down all the time and have a good laugh with them when I see them. It is cool actually, a similar situation in the gym I go to because I go first thing in the morning and I think just the demographic of the actual area, it's a sort of, it's almost in a village, a place called Buckton and the, the gym is on the marina down there so it's a wonderful setting, you've got the river that kind of arches round into the, the marina area or the boat side, you've got all these log cabins and houses down there which I think some people live full time there other people use them as almost holiday or weekend re retreat places yeah but the the demographic is I would say definitely majority over over 55 so a lot of retirees there you know a lot of people who are just coming in and you know it's actually a really social part of their day because they come in and meet their friends and you see ladies walking up and down in the pool just chatting other people in the gym just sort of really there it's great because they're, they're combining exercises of, of some description yeah with, sitting in the pool <laughs> yeah well, but you know they're, they're, at least they're doing something yeah you know, they're yeah. not just sitting in a coffee shop eating cakes you know and, or sitting at home yeah you know there, there's a real i won't go into community I mean, there's, a lot, there's a lot of stuff out there now about the importance of, of community and, and communal living and you know being sociable now i think we've always known the necessity of it but you know loneliness is something that is so it's particularly people of a certain age, but I think, you know, of, of any age, it's, it's something that's really, really detrimental. You know, people yeah. need interaction with other human beings, no matter how much of an introvert you are. Yeah. You know, you still need that human connection on, on some sort of level. But anyway, you see these guys and they're all there, as I say, chatting away. They're quite happily, you know, chat to anyone you like. So I was having conversations in the changing room or you get some people come and sit in the sauna and, and tell me how bad the place is because things are falling apart and need replacing. And I'm just like, 
it's fine. It works for me. It's got everything I possibly need. But you know, they they're really there every day and they're really invested in the place. Yeah, so yeah. They always want to point out all the little cracks and the things that haven't been working and how long it's been since they replaced the shower in the <laughs> sorry the, the shampoo in the shower. And all, this, <laughs> all this stuff and you just sat there going, yeah, and that's terrible, isn't it? You know, they really need to get on it. And oh my god, how much do we pay for a membership? And yeah, but it's cool. It's it's really fun because it just gets you out of your own head a little bit. You know, having conversations and. I think it's a really valuable lesson Yeah. to actually spend time with people. You know, we spend end up spending a lot of time with, apart from our, maybe our parents, we spend a lot of time with our own peer group and maybe people who are a bit younger than us, but it's so important to spend time with people who are older, whether it's 10, 20 or 30 or 40 years older than you because, you know, the lessons you can derive from that experience are, are massive. So uh, Mostly yeah. about the war. Mostly but, about the war. you know, they're lessons nonetheless. Yeah, but I mean, what great lessons, you know, what what a better way to learn about, you know, human endeavour that yeah. people went through at that period of time. And I think it's, I'm not saying we need war anymore. It's certainly something that, you know, you hope that as a species we've progressed beyond. But there's a lot of good arguments out there and, you know, just Google it to find, you know, things of most relevance where people really debate heavily, you know, how beneficial war has actually been to human evolution, how it's played an integral part, you know, the the post-World War II world that we live in, you know, the sort of the liberal, I guess the liberal ideologies that have come out of the extremity of, of that sort of conflict and the ideologies at that sort of time have shaped the world in the last 50 or 60 years to what it is now. Hmm. So those things can sometimes have their place, but... Um, yeah, now everyone just prefers to go to football matches and rugby and shout at people wearing different coloured shirts rather than shoot them. So, yeah, you know, and, that, that, and it's I not guess that bad maybe, at the rugby. It's not like hooliganism. No, definitely not. And you know, I'm I'm not uh, I'm certainly not a fan or an advocate of any sort of hooliganism at, at sporting events. And you know, the the idea of being a fan of a, an individual team. Well, I, I certainly you know I have a club. I'm a Tottenham Hotspur fan um, because that's just the way I've been brought up. But you know, I don't hate people who are Arsenal supporters just because they wear a different colour shirt. You know, that the level of competition in a, in a game or when a game is taking place and the little bit of banter you can have about it, fine. You know, that's kind of fun. That competitive nature is, as I say, something that's in, intrinsic to, to all human beings. It's something that, especially in men, is, in young men in particular, is there. But, yeah, you, know, you can take it too far, let's be honest. So, yeah. Um, anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. Sorry. No, that's OK. No, <laughs> let's bring that's it back. Fine. Whoosh. Um, I'm a rugby boy through and through me I'm not really that bothered about the football Cardiff do follow, Blues do you follow, uh, who do you follow sorry Cardiff Blues Cardiff Blues yeah, yeah. I was kind of a I'm, I've never really been you think I was like a Saracens fan or something like that being from London but I might actually kind of have a bit more of an affinity to Gloucester just because a good friend of mine at university one of my best friends was from Gloucester and he was a big Gloucester fan and because I didn't particularly have a, a club side that I supported that's where it ends up going yeah yeah, well, he just bought me a Gloucester woolly hat, and I was like, right, yeah, fine, okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> now sold. I can go to the matches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, now I can be one of you, um, <laughs> except with a better accent. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, you've got anyway. a point there. You do. Yeah, I, d I don't think anyone from uh, Gloucestershire or, or Somerset or anywhere like that listens to this show yet, so. <laughs> Wait till they do, they'll be round. Yeah, exactly. Where and was they it? Never Bacton, ever will. Chris, they'll be down Marina waiting for you. <laughs> Brilliant. They'll just be anyway, waiting so... for someone to come up to him singing a song and they'll be like, There he is, it's Chris! Yeah, Get him! him! He said we have funny accents. <laughs> damn him. Uh, yeah, so anyway, let's get let's get back onto some training stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we said we wouldn't do tangents, mm. which was clearly, clearly uh, an overly ambitious sentiment yeah yeah you know there's this podcast i've listened to for ages called uh mindset by design right i don't know if you heard about it this dude he's an absolute legend and i feel terrible now because i can't remember his name but uh, andy andy, andy murphy yes uh, okay. thanks andy andy a legend mate anyway i've been listening to it since he kind of brought it out like a couple of years ago and he had a running joke where he was like, oh, we do these 10 minute tune ups to talk about different elements of your mindset. And every 10 minute tune up episode is like an hour plus. <laughs> 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 it's so funny. Anyway, well, this... if, you're, if you're into that kind of stuff, like mindset, uh, kind of self-development stuff, check out Mindset by Design. The guy is genius and he has some really cool guests on. 
Cool. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll need more podcasts in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. I honestly, I have to periodically go through and just remove um, and unsubscribe to things. Not because I don't like the shows, because of just my feed any given day it becomes overwhelming doesn't it you suddenly like about oh, 10 oh my god I've got all this work to do I know exactly. <laughs> I've got to, to do all these conversations it's, it's like YouTube it's, you just convince yourself that oh this is productive you know this is time well spent mm. and it's like it's really not you know I'm just I'm all about minimalism at the moment you know everything in life is just whittling it down to the, the bare possible barest possible number of, Look of mentors and coaches and you know, places to, to be inspired and to learn from you know, to try and really hone that down because a lot of the stuff is, is very similar across the board you know what gets said nowadays you know a lot of what there's very very rarely new stuff that gets said it's just things that get repackaged you know you can read Aristotle from two and a half thousand years ago or Stoic philosophy and you just go, oh, right, okay, so this is just a self-help book, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. It's just an adaptation on a prior concept or someone going that bit deeper into a smaller component of someone else's story or someone else's book. You know, they've picked a chapter and gone, oh, right, this is... The whole book now. Yeah, this is a whole book, which, in fairness, it, it is. You know, you can go deeper and deeper into each individual area, but how much of it you actually really need to know to apply in your own life, you know... More often than not, you're only going to take one or two things from it anyway. So, I mean, the, that's the, why I like this book called, right, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Okay. And uh, it's amazing. It is the fastest book I ever read, right? It's literally four agreements. I read the contents, they were the four agreements. <laughs> and then uh, I, I thought about it for an hour and read the introduction. And I have actually read the whole book, but I needed just a quick fix. So I literally read the contents and like the first two pages of the intro and I was like, yeah, sorted. Mm. And you know what? It helped massively. <laughs> it sounds like I've just, uh, that I'm taking a piss and that's just a throwaway thing, but it's not, not at all. I literally, mm. uh, that was exactly what I needed right then. And mm. I, I read it and I was sorted. I was like, boom, I get it. Well, a lot of books in particular can be quite padded as well. Yeah. You know, the, the act, the actual value in the book is only maybe spread a across the equivalent of a couple of pages, but people would like to expand on things. They like to really detail them. Some people need a bit more explanation and also to have a book, you need a certain number of pages. So, you know, you have to have, you don't have to have, sorry, that's the wrong thing to say, but in a lot of cases you will have a, a certain percentage of filler, you know, people telling their stories, using anecdotes and whatnot to explain the processes and whatnot. And personally, I'd, I like to kind of get to the meat of things and it's why I use a service like Blinkist. I'm not sure if I've mentioned that before, but it's essentially a book summary only, you know, for self-development, self-help business-based oh, cool. books. But um, yeah, Blinkist.com uh, really, I think it's .com, but anyway, Blinkist anyway. And um, yeah, they just do pretty much the equivalent of like 15 page summaries or supposedly everything. It'll take you 15 minutes to go through the summary of the actual book yeah and there's still a certain degree of warmth to it you know it talks about the author says this and it's it feels very natural it's not just bullet points you know it still has a certain flow to it but it's broken down to the real as i say the real core of, of the ideas within any given chapter and they have an audio version as well so if you don't necessarily want to sit through hours of an audio book um on audible then you can use that and take it in and sit there and take some notes and, and jot things down so mm. that they become really applicable because you know even if you only take down 50% of the content in, in terms of your notes, it's still going to be highly valuable rather than writing down things which maybe weren't as applicable when you were listening to the full book or reading the full book. So, yeah, um, yeah check it out, Blinkist.com. I've actually, if you go to coachthatch.com, I've actually got a link on my website, on my resources page to that. Uh, full disclaimer, it is a, an affiliate link, so I do get a tiny little commission kickback. You don't get charged any more for it. But, mm -hmm. um, and 50% wanna... of that goes to Reese as well. So uh, it feels good in that you're feeding both of us. <laughs> you're feeding both of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't eat unless you go and sign up for services. But it is, it is cool. It's about, I think it's about $50 a year to subscribe, which compared to, I think it's something like $8 a month for Audible when you get one book credit every month. You actually weigh that up. You can consume a lot more content very concisely yeah. and, and you know quickly yeah. from using something like Blinkist. It may not feel as fully authentic because you're not taking in the full book, but it depends what you, particularly in sort of self-help. I think Audible is great for fiction uh, 
books. You know, if you want to listen to something while you're driving, you really want to get out of your head and yeah. you know listen to something of, of real sort of creative worth. Then I think you know those that can be really really valuable. But when something really breaks everything down much more exactly into the actual working points of, of what the book was intending to be in the first place, I think that becomes a bit more valuable from a, a self development and business perspective. So. Um, yeah, yeah, check it yeah out. definitely. Yeah, that Blinkist, man, I'll check that out. That's actually pretty cool. It is yeah. awesome. Cool. Right, so now let's get back into training. <laughs> I love tangents, they're brilliant. Um, but anyway, yeah, so uh, uh, what I've been doing, mate, recently is, um, I'm, like I say, last in the last episode I was talking about trying my handstands in different positions, trying to intentionally off-balance myself to build that stability. Mm. And what I've been trying to do is I can, I can come down from a handstand into an elbow lever, I can like go through into an L sit, or it's more of like a Russian lever what I do, I can get my legs right up, like a, some people call it a V sit, but it's actually more. Um, yeah, and uh, what I've been doing is going down to 90 degrees instead. So I've come up, up in the handstand, mm -hmm. and then I just bend up my hips, and you have to lean it forward past your hands like you do uh, with like a handstand push-up kind of or yeah, like so coming down in a planche but um you're offsetting the weight of your legs then yeah exactly yeah. and you come down to literally that 90 degrees and it's really confusing for your brain because you don't know where your legs are so you have mm. to try and work out where that perfect point is and for mm. me i always feel like i'm about 40 uh, sorry about a uh, well past that 90 degree i feel like i'm like pointing straight down at the floor of my feet but i'm actually boom right there Mm. That's been really cool. It's been really fun to try and learn. Uh, to, uh, that is like a new goal. Do you know what I mean? Whilst I've been doing this, I've been, oh, like a 90 degree handstand, that'd be pretty cool. And like, I used to be able to do like from a, a handstand press, like a pike press, come up to about 90 degrees and like hold it. But I mean, it wasn't very long <laughs> and uh, it, <laughs> it was really hard for me to do because that's like the hardest part of the press, the handstand, but getting your feet up that first 90 degrees because afterwards it's like pressing with your sh uh, your shoulders straight and your legs kind of come up by themselves almost but that mm. first little bit that point of leverage where you're right leant over past your hands and your bum's sticking in the air and your legs are like you're trying just to bring your toes off the ground just doo -doo -doo, you know what i mean mm. uh yeah so that's been really fun yeah it sounds cool yeah sounds like a lot of fun yeah yeah and i've, I've been trying to do uh handstand push-ups in that position when i get there as well but to be honest, you holding it for long enough to start to do a decent negative is uh, hard enough. Like. <laughs> yeah, well, all good things in time. You know, it's just finding the right progressive path to, yeah. to achieve that. Well, but no, it sounds sound quite fun. I mean, my my handstand work at the moment really has sort of been limited to just wall stands, just trying to really tighten up the alignment. You know, I, I just don't believe I've got that strong an alignment at the moment. So just trying to tidy things up really kind of focus on the hollow body position um get my what should what are your thoughts on hand positioning with a handstand you know what's an optimal position directly underneath the shoulders or just yeah. outside directly directly underneath, underneath the shoulders because yeah. you want to be stacked like when you're standing up mm. your legs are right underneath your body aren't they the, if you stand spread out when your, your arms are your, your feet far out you can be blown in either direction and fall over. It's exactly mm. the same with a handstand, except exponentially exaggerated. It's like squared, the sure. difficulty of it, because you're not used to being, and your leg, your arm muscles are tiny in comparison to your massive leg muscles, you know? Mm. So you have to work a lot harder for the stability. Have your hands narrow, you can lock out your arms a lot easier, making it much more stable and much more efficient. And in terms of hand position, so as you're, planted obviously fingers spread but sort of fingers pointed directly forward or don't um, again, I, I try out. to but it's what's comfortable for your wrists because mm. I don't find yeah so I don't find being completely square comfortable I, I sort of no, turn out probably, I don't either I probably turn out about 30 degrees it's not a lot yeah anymore. yeah what with um with like uh floor skills like planching and crow stands and stuff i i tell people often to start with their thumbs forwards mm. their thumbs like so your hands your fingers are sticking out at 45 degrees but yeah. with a handstand it's better to be tighter in 
Uh, you need your fingers spread, obviously, but don't think of your all your fingers being square forwards because it, it limits that control and that stability. You want to be yeah. able to grab the ground like a nice pair of boobs with your with your hands. You know, you want to be like squeezing in like whilst to stabilize yourself because that is where you're going to be balancing from there in your core. Sure. Yeah, no, it's a good point. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll... Um, the important I'll, thing, mate, to be honest with you, with your handstands, uh, I, I, I tell everyone to get away from the wall as soon as possible. Mm. Yeah, if yeah you, no, it, it's purely just a, an alignment thing, really, just to kind of get comfortable. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm starting to notice a bit of tension in my back when I was trying any, any freestanding positions. And okay. I know that's because I'm you know, hyperextending through my lumbar spine, so I'm kind of bananaing uh, right. a little bit. So this is just purely a, a technical practice. I've been doing some um, handstand presses as well just to get a bit of strength back in the shoulders from again my, my previous layoff as yeah. it were and um, yeah I mean that's working quite nicely um, I was actually doing them this morning which was good fun and then basically I just do for reps handstand presses and then I just hold and really you know once I knew I couldn't get down and up again I just then hold out for as long as I could but just really focusing in on the alignment and hollowing out yeah and just trying to tighten up the position. Press and, ups, you mean handstand? Like hand handstand press ups. Yeah, 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 sorry. But obviously it's great because once you've pre-fatigued by doing the reps, you then, you know, then putting yourself into a position of really focusing on the, the, the hold itself. Yeah, and that, you, it, it uh, highlights the weaker points. Mm, definitely, so it was good. So I feel, I feel quite strong from that. And I, I was basically just doing a very simple drill where I was, as I say, hollowing out and positioning, and then I, my bum was still against the wall, but I was just bringing my heels off at the top and just pointing the toes, and then I'd alternate between doing that and then leaving the heels on and bringing my bum out slightly. You know, so I was alternating between bum and heels just to get away from the wall, but still have that as a marker of how straight yeah. I was. So that worked Try out quite this, nicely. Right? Do, you, do you usually do your presses with your back against the wall or your feet against the wall? My my front, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I yeah, I used to when I was I was developing up to a, a straight position. I would often do them facing the wall. I'd kind of walk back up the wall. Yeah, like do so a, I, a wall walk into it and then do your presses. Yeah, but now I will tend to just because I can get up by myself without having to walk up the wall. I just sort of go against do it the, the wall. Other way. What I find with that, I, I find both have different benefits. Yeah, but I can get my. The problem is when I walk up. Sometimes getting as close to the wall as I like, I still feel like I'm bananaing a little bit. I can't always necessarily get my the heel of my hands in as tight to the wall as I want. Yeah. Um, okay. Just but, because of skirting boards and things yeah, like that. Yeah, you Whereas won't. I, you won't get that as close to the wall. But you'll. Uh, I, I find that I can get. I get closer to the wall that way. Well, I'm more comfortable being away from the wall. Sorry, let me get that right. When I'm when I do it with if I did it with my back against the wall or f my front facing out. Mm. I'd find the bottom of my back like curls up all weird and it encourages that extended lumbar spine. So you end up almost training into that a little bit because right. to do the press, you're like out from the wall and your hands are like out from the wall and you're, you're almost like hollow back in, doing hollow back presses rather than handstand presses, you know? Oh yeah, certainly when you're actually doing the presses. I yeah, mean, that's, yeah. That, that's something I try and be super vigilant on but yeah you're right as you fatigue you know, it becomes more about just getting back up rather yeah. than worrying about how position what shape you're in yeah or where whether you're being nice and balanced but you do it the other way around and you can stick your bum out a little bit so you can be in more of a hollow body position mm. and you can you can take one leg away from the wall slightly not raising it to vertical like mm. leap just away from the wall and your hands and your body will naturally be further away from the wall and your head and your, your like shoulders will be further out than your hands even. But mm. it'll teach you the, the right position to do freestanding presses. It'll help you learn that hollow body position and retrain that core tension so that you're not super extended all the time. Because it's really easy to get stuck super extended and then when you come to an actual straight line handstand, you feel like you're bent over the other way and your hips are like, uh, coming towards that 90 degrees like we were talking about earlier. Mm. Yeah, no, good points. No, yeah. I will certainly try and apply that. Yeah, yeah, That's, that was the big, one of the big exercises for me for doing, learning freestanding handstand push-ups. Is mm. that stepping, getting away from the wall, but having my face towards it, and just being in, yeah, and just like being in like a half a handstand press position with my legs like up against the wall somewhere, but 
and I almost just one leg resting against the wall for balance. Mm. And I'm like out in front of it and it's a bit weird getting used to it, but it teaches you that stability. Uh, okay, not in the ideal position, but as close to that position as you're going to get when you're doing it freestanding anyway. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, um, maybe I'll <clears throat> try and factor that into my next cycle for January because, yeah, yeah this, this cycle really is all about getting back to basics. So uh, I think some higher skill development stuff would playing quite nicely into the new year so I will factor that in yeah and the great thing with a handstand as well is they're they're quick to learn but they take forever to master and there are loads of different things you can try and mess around with Uh, I've been able to do handstands for ages but I'm still going through learning processes with it I still struggle with different things and I it's fun like um constantly seeing little improvements handstands one of those things that kind of you you follow through uh when you're doing body weight training and uh you know you you can look at your overall progression by looking at how your handstands go in or how it's improved over the last six months or the last two cycles three cycles whatever and you can go ah oh, i used to be like this this is a photo from six months ago and like look at my handstand now like look what i can do look at all these crazy little things i can work with it which before were just um, impossible. Yeah, no, definitely. And it, look, it, it's a perfect example that there is no such thing as perfection. You know, you can have the 80, 90, 100 year old martial arts master who's still refining the foundational aspects of their art, you know, who's still focusing in on fine tuning their stances, you know, really focusing on their breathing, always going back to basics. So it doesn't hurt even when you can do a handstand to just go back to the wall and spend a bit of time lining up and tightening things up you know it's still Mm. highly valuable you know breaking everything down like we've talked about before into component parts you know and you know advancement is is fantastic progression is great pushing yourself to do new things or new variations of exercises that you feel you've since mastered and i think maybe it's the fallacy of mastery is that you know i can do it mastery (laughs) yeah (laughs) i can do it therefore i've got it in the bank and yeah you can do it to the point that Maybe the someone else would viable. look at you and go, yeah, that's a good handstand. But other people would look at you and go, mm, that's not a great handstand. And you yourself might think, yeah, no, this does feel like it could be better. You know, it's always about the detail. And it doesn't hurt to be obsessive about things to that extent. You know, it depends what result you want, what you want your ultimate outcome to be of anything that you're actually pursuing. And I'm not saying you have to be you know, overly dedicated just to one thing. I'm, I'm all about you know, keeping some degree of variety, particularly with movement, you know, if you just spent all your time bench pressing, you know, that would come with so many different limitations, but, mm. you know, equally that's not a very high skill yeah. issue. So something like handstand, you know, let's say you want to spend all your time just doing handstands to get really, really good at them. Like we've mentioned previously, there are certain elements of it that will diminish because you're not paying attention to strengthening other muscles through other different movements and other stability patterns and movement patterns and whatnot. And imbalances will naturally start to occur that will impede your ability to progress. So there is a necessity for some variety and, and attention to other areas, but picking those things that really require that little bit more work, that bit more attention to regression and progression in equal measure, going back and refining the, you know, the finer points of the very basic basic foundational elements of the actual position or the move, you know, it has huge benefits, you know, going backwards as much as forwards. And like we mentioned earlier on, you know, ties in quite nicely when I said about spending time with people who are beyond you, whether that be people in terms of their expertise and their experience in a professional environment, or it's just people who've just got more life experience. Yeah. Spend more time with people ahead of you, spend a lot of time with people behind you, you know, be a perpetual student, but also be a teacher as well. And that applies to your training um, as much as anything else in your life as well. So it's really important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to reiterate it? everything you said then, but I thought you just said it all, there's no point. <laughs> <That's fantastic. Well, laughs> One thing I've... I do like about handstands, yep. um, and this, this pertains to my next cycle, which is coming up, coming soon to a park slash gymnasium slash hall near you my skill cycle right which is a lot of people struggle with getting into actual skill progressive training because they they coming out of a strength cycle you think you're doing reps and sets and it's not always like that yeah with a yeah with a high um a stressful like a high energy 
strength move like a front lever or a planche or something you can't do in the sets especially not at the start not even the progressions and you can work some of the exercises you can make like rep variations of different movements as supportive exercises but doing those isometric holds for time takes so much energy and um, effort on your part that you can't do them for a session you know so mm. the what you've got to understand is that a lot of it isn't about strength necessarily. Things like an L-sit, you have the requisite strength probably to do that. It's being able to control your body. Yeah, so a skill session is often, a skill cycle, sorry, is often about doing a specific drills and like um, to, to develop that control rather than to be building the strength for it. That's why you do your strength cycle first to get your strength in line. You know, you, you, you knock your, um, your, muscle, your muscle power up a level and then you work on the control of it and you work to develop the neural connections so that you can activate that muscle better and more efficiently and to a, a greater degree of manipulation and, and mastery of that particular, of any kind of movement that involves those muscles. Yeah. So with that in mind, you can't just go down the gym and do five sets of 20 mus uh, sorry, not muscle ups, front levers, because you, you won't be able to do it. You'll fatigue too fast, and then you'll end up doing hanging L sits instead, which is definitely not a front lever. So what you do instead is just do it often, but in isolated elements. So a front lever may not be the best example of this because it might you might struggle to do this in a lot of places but mm -hmm. go into handstands you can do a handstand anywhere yeah and although a handstand isn't a high strength skill uh, if you were learning say handstand push-ups you can do your handstand push-ups you might only be able to do negatives yeah and doing them away from the wall when you're doing them just freestanding, it's very difficult to do multiple reps of them if you don't have a stable handstand to begin with. So mm. the idea is to build up that neuromuscular connection, that muscle activating, that activation, sorry, that ability to control those muscles, improve that, and then you'll in automatically step up your handstand push-up game. Mm. And this is something I've been working on because my stability in my handstands I mean, it's good. Don't uh, uh, I'm not like shitting on my handstand ability because I can handstand. I'm pretty good at handstands, you know. <laughs> yep. Not as good as I am at beatboxing. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't. <coughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> not today. I was encouraging myself to tail off. Then I'm on. Yep. I'm on a. I'm in a zone here. So we have to. We have to police ourselves and each other on these. <laughs> yeah, this is more than self-censoring, guys. And I'd like to point out. Just by announcing this, this is the first time I've mentioned flutter kicks in this episode. So, woo, I feel like there should be streamers and bangers and cracklers and fizz poppers and all kinds of stuff going off right now because we're on did you just, episode did you nine. Just... It's the first time I haven't mentioned flutter kicks. <laughs> but you just did. Yeah, I know, but that doesn't count because I'm, you know, what I mean. But yeah, so the idea instead of trying to do an hour of handstand push-ups like freestanding where you're not using the wall or anything you're just specifically working that is it's almost impossible so what you do instead is you split up your time and do lots of them over an extended period of time rather than concentrating all of your training into an hour slot down the gym or down the park or whatever so in the morning you might do a couple of handstands, do some negatives or whatever, just keep working on that stability. Then maybe when you come home from work, if you if you work like in an office or whatever, you probably can't try them on the train when you're commuting or whatever. But it's when you get home, you could do it like 10 minutes, say try like five, six handstands. Hour later, just before dinner, you could probably do some more. Then like an hour after dinner, maybe you mess around in front of the TV when you're watching elementary or or, uh, it's only, or it's always sunny in Philadelphia, because they're basically the only two things I watch. And uh, you, you know what I mean? You can, you can slot it into times where you're kind of not really doing anything, but you could, so you can be training in those, in those moments, mm. but not, not heavy. You, know, you don't have to have a shower after every, every time you go, right, I'm gonna we'll just work on my skills for five minutes. You know, you're not really gonna break a sweat much, but you're gonna mm. feel, you're, you're just pushing that fatigue. 
yeah so mm -hmm. you're consistently fatiguing your 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 activation of your muscles rather than the strength element of it and what yeah. that does is it fixes that movement pattern in your brain so that right. over time you get more and more and more capable of being able to hold that position because you're teaching your brain that position it's like jumping you know or standing if if i stand a lot i get pretty good at standing when i'm a baby i couldn't stand the more i try standing the better i get at it it's exactly the same with handstands with planches with front levers all of it so if you can find a way of doing it multiple times through the day i feel a bit like dr zeus at the minute <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so if you can, if you can work it into a better element, then you can mix that skill training. You can do it all the time without worrying about over fatiguing yourself, uh, doing any damage to your wrists, like uh, like I've kind of been suffering with your forearms or anything, just because you're you're pushing it too much in one go. Mm. And you can you can fit that training in. You can do loads and loads of sets. You can do loads and loads of reps of an exercise or holds or whatever. You can do loads of them, high volume, but spread out over a lot of time so that you you're not you're not killing yourself or you're not wasting time. You're like you go down the gym. You're like yeah, I'm gonna do planche training down the gym, and then you go down there, you do one planche, and then you can't do anything anymore because you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're like, oh, what, what do I do now? I'm gonna go do some bench presses. <laughs> <laughs> So I kind of I think I've said that I think I will beat around the bush about for about ten minutes there, but I'm pretty sure I got it in by the end of it that you should just be doing loads of them all the time when you can. That's basically what my skill cycle looks like. I will have training days, but it'll be less. You know, I'll, I'll be I'll ease off that, and when I do, I'll be working on my rings stuff like that cable exercise we spoke about. I'll do lots of them. I'll do lots of uh, muscle ups and and uh, supported work down gymnastic well i won't be actually because i won't be in so it'll just be a couple of little strength sessions a week rather than every day and i'll do consistent skills training high volume spread out across all all the days every day i'll just do it all the time i'll just spend a month doing like handstands and stuff sounds like fun yeah we'll yeah. just walk around everywhere in your hands yeah <laughs> i was talking to a guy about the pommel right and uh I was explaining about the hollow body position where you have your shoulders fully protracted, like they mm. fully brought forward like you would with a planche or like, a, yeah, something like that with on the pommel. And uh, I was like, oh yeah, you've got to do this like, and showing him, I was just standing, like showing him that position. He goes, what, how do you even do that? I'm like, you're basically pushing your shoulders forward. He was, I was like, you need to learn this position. I was like, just stand like it, do it at work you know, go to the shops like it, whatever it takes, just stay in this position as much as possible so you can teach yourself that. And um, yeah, that was it really, that was the end of the story. Cool, fair enough. That was enlightening. Yeah, none of you could see the position I was making, so you don't really get it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I stopped, I was really not helping. <laughs> no, that's the problem, isn't it, sometimes with, oh, hang on. Something just started on my computer. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I've yeah, that's why, that's why it's a problem you have, isn't it, with doing audio. Like, I, I do a lot of gesticulation. I, you know, I'm moving around as I'm talking about things, kind of demonstrating what I'm doing. I'm like, no one can see me. Yeah, yeah. It, like, it comes you know, across any... in your voice, I think. But, uh, but yeah. I you... think the passion and the enthusiasm does. But, you know, if someone can actually from the audio decipher like when oh we, he's we lifting explain, his left arm <laughs> yeah well, he, mu he must be lifting his left arm but I, do you find it is really really interesting and this is where guided meditation for example um and, and coaching on any level you know certainly physiologically really is hugely valuable just having someone there to to guide you through a process you know if someone's deadlifting you know if i'm coaching someone one-to-one -one in person and you know they're lifting through and i'm like I can, you know, I can obviously how I have a much more objective viewpoint of what's going on with their body. You know, I can see every angle of it. I can walk around and ascertain that, and it's where the value of a a, a coach becomes, you know, massively, uh, massively increased because you can have that real visual impact and you know really see what's happening. And I can say to someone, you know, lift your chest, you know, tighten your abs, squeeze your glutes, you know, all those kind of very basic coaching points for a deadlift. Likewise with guided meditation. If you're, you know, your mind's slowly wandering off and you've lost track of, of your, your kind of focus and someone says, you know, focus on your breathing. You know, when someone says something, the power of 
just someone suggesting something or, you know, orotating, is that a word, orotating? <laughs> the, uh, a, a direction, you know, an instruction. If I say, if I start saying now, as people are listening to this, if I just say, start thinking about taking deep breaths, take a real deep breath. If I start talking about the breath in general, I guarantee anyone listening to this will just start breathing a little bit more consciously, more deeply, a little bit more consciously. You know, they'll start to actually think about doing it. So it's amazing, really, that you know, you can have even just through a, a podcast and like an audio medium like this. You can have a real impact. So when I'm saying what I'm doing, obviously I'm acting it out as I'm actually speaking the words, but someone listening to this may themselves start to kind of move in that way in response to what I'm actually talking about. We're so speaking audio does have brains. a real power in that respect. You know, the human voice, you know, that's really what we've survived on for thousands of years in terms of sharing information and, and responding to that in kind. You know, the human voice has a deep impact on a very primal level with all of us. So mm. it can still be powerful. But in this day and age, it does help to have a visual cue for something as well. Yeah, yeah. Particularly skills like strength skills and training skills and stuff. Because it is quite <laughs> yeah. a visual thing, you know. It, it can get quite visual, yeah. Exactly. Unless you know the, the exact terms that we're talking about when we get into it. You know, it's quite difficult. I can understand that. And that's why we make our show notes, guys. Okay, and you can get all our show notes at morethanlifting.com slash episode nine for episode nine, today's episode. If you want to watch, uh, check out last week's episode, write episode eight instead, fill in the blanks, it's pretty simple. And that's how you get the show notes, all the supporting content, we stick videos up there. I'm still waiting for uh, that thing off Chris. Uh, <laughs> I'll cut that out. <laughs> was, this, was, this, was this that thing I said I'd do that I didn't? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Maybe, maybe it wasn't quite as important as the thing that you did. It probably... Oh, I hate it when your phone goes off, you know, when you're doing stuff. So That's like, why you turn it off. Sorry, mate. I'm recording onto it, onto my phone. But you can kill the signal. I could, yeah. Actually, good idea. I'll do that in future. And I only, I only say that confidently because I've left my phone on previously and it's gone off. Yeah, <laughs> uh, multiple times in the past. So, yeah, I've, I'm only learning from my mistakes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so if, if people do want to understand what we're talking about, if they don't already, you know, I'm not saying you, you don't have a good grasp of what we're talking about already, but if you don't know, you do head on over to the website. Or if you go on the internet and you type G-O-O-G-L-E, that takes you to this really cool place where you can search for anything you like. So... Oh that my be god! Quite handy as well. <laughs> G O O G L E. Yeah, mate, I'm checking that out. Yeah, it's amazing. Like honestly, I, I just discovered it the other day, and it's it's changed my changed my life. It's got all the answers. It has. Yeah, what? I mean, and I, I believe 100 percent everything I read off of there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. You need a valuable source of information you can trust. You certainly do. Yeah. So don't you can check that out, guys. G O O G L E, or you can subscribe to the podcast for more episodes coming in the future. Check out all of our previous ones and stuff. Um, I'm kind of saying this because I feel like we're coming to the end of the session, and I'm trying to postpone rock paper scissors as long as possible. <laughs> don't we have to do that before you do the outro? Otherwise, it becomes moot. Oh yeah, of course. Okay, the right. The whole point of doing rock paper scissors was about the doing outro. the outro. Okay. So yeah, have we have we come to a, a, an agreement on the wild card? Yeah, wild cards aren't just acceptable; they're encouraged house rules for the More Lifting Podcast Rock Paper Scissors Tournament, which is an ongoing uh, score sheet that I've been keeping track of for who's winning. At the minute, I'm up, Chris. Okay. So Fine. you better pull out all the stops today, mate. Are we ready? Yeah, I think so <laughs> <laughs> you know you know the the you know how it works after three four ready three two one guinea Christmas pig dog. what did you say <laughs> cruise missile cruise missile i'm a guinea pig <laughs> well you said i've got to up the game so it's almost like you threw that you've just given me that as, as almost like a freebie you won't even try and what the hell does a guinea pig beat paper Oh, well, because they're going to eat paper. Yeah. Right. And that's it. The only thing a guinea pig 
can beat his paper. Well, I or mean, or a smaller guinea pig, perhaps. Yeah, or maybe uh, hamster. A, yeah, hamster. Hamsters would have no chance. We say that. I don't know. They're they're pretty violent creatures. I used to have hamsters, and you put them in a cage together, and they would try and murder each other with all their fluffy fluff stuff. <laughs> yeah. Have you not noticed? Like the smaller something is, the bigger chip it has on its shoulder. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like little dogs, you know, it's like when you get these little Jack Russells sort of come oh, up mate. against an Alsatian and you know, and they the don't shut just like, up. He's like, give over me. Yeah, what is that? You know, it's like, <laughs> he's like, oi, 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 yeah. oi, oi. <laughs> what would you say about me? <laughs> I was having a great chat with my uncle about dogs, like how we can learn a lot from them in terms of just how binary yeah, they are. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll be in a park, he, he's got a couple of dogs and they'll be out walking and, you know, they'll be sniffing around and, really happy and just content and just, you know, exploring the, the, uh, the surroundings. And another dog will come past and, it, rawr, 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 and just absolutely go off on one. You know, <laughs> it'll just lose itself completely. And then once the other dog's gone, just boom, straight yeah. back into being happy again. You know, none of this telling itself uh, a story. I think I mentioned before uh, a podcast I listened to, a lady called Tara Brucht, who does meditation retreats and some really, really insightful spiritual podcasts. I, I certainly, that's one I would never ever unsubscribe from because I find it exceptionally valuable and she always tells that story about you know how unlike dogs we tell ourselves story you know someone will walk past and we don't like the look and you know they give us or something they say to us and then afterwards we're continually telling ourselves a story about oh I'm going to get that person back I can't believe they disrespected me you know? yeah I never take it so personally exactly one of the four you know, agreements don't you take think like a dog personally. just like as soon as it's out of sight out of mind forget about it move on it's happened it's in the past it's done you know as long as you're still upright and breathing and that person hasn't infringed on your liberty in an excessive way i.e. assaulted you physically then whatever you know yeah. just, just let, let it, it flow on by you know be be a binary dog yeah binary dogs a lot to be anyway. doing there <laughs> so do you want to do you want to re rock paper paper scissors? Yeah, I feel or? like I, I feel like I did go a bit easy compared to your cruise missile. I thought you were going to have something. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know what you were going to have. Well, I did actually. I was I was contemplating doing microwave. A microwave. Well, because I did a kettle last week, and I thought microwave would make it still relatively entertaining, and it was also the first thing I saw because again, I'm, I'm near my kitchen. So then, I, then obviously that would have beaten a guinea pig as well because you know put a guinea pig in a microwave, see what happens. Okay, okay, right. Never done that, don't recommend it. That's not something <laughs> I'm endorsing, so please actually don't do that. Um, I'm all for animal welfare and rights and whatnot, so um, I would very much discourage you from doing anything like that. But for the purposes of this game, I thought it would be a good shout. But then I thought, no, so you set up the ante, so I thought I'll go one bigger. Yeah, all right. <laughs> one bigger. <laughs> one bigger than cruise a missile. Gu uh, guinea pig a cruise missile. Yeah. No, one bigger than a microwave. But anyway. So. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right. This time we're having it. You ready? Right, we're having it. After having three, it. four, three, two, one, kill a shark. <laughs> you didn't even do anything. <laughs> so I froze. I actually, honestly, that was a real it's present moment. Too that many. That was almost like pure options. meditation. I was at one with everything because there was no thought. Absolutely nothing there. It was like a, it was like a grey void where I slipped between dimensional membranes, and I was one and nothing at the same time. Maybe my killer shark ate you. Maybe it did. And you were just yeah. in the uh, in the belly of the beast. Okay, fine. I like I like the killer shark angle though. That was kind of fun. It was quite so. specific, you know. Not any old shark. This yeah. one's a killer. <laughs> it's a killer. Okay, I'm pretty sure most of them are carnivorous, so they all kill to some extent. Yeah, yeah. Well, but this is, you know, this is this is a, like a vigilante shark. Oh right, okay. he goes around, he, he takes matters fighting into his own hands, shark, crime. <laughs> shark crime. Shark <laughs> crime. Oh, we've done it again, haven't we? That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> Should we do? Are we doing a third one? <laughs> uh, do you know what? I, I can't even face it. Okay, um, I tell you what. What we'll do. Instead of rock, paper, scissor, we'll do highest number wins. So you have to pick a number between one and a hundred, and it just, you can't pick anything, I don't know. That's How does highest number win? Like that, it's a hundred. A hundred's the highest number. Okay, no, fine, all right, okay, we don't put a limit on it, you just have to pick the highest possible number you can, and you can't say infinity, because that's just a cop-out. Okay, what about infinity plus one? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> God, I love having that on conversations. <laughs> okay. Right, ready? Yeah, so just any number you like. Any number, yeah, yeah, cool. Right. Three, two, one, sixty three. Three thousand six hundred and ninety two. <laughs> what was your sixty three? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'll have that then. Uh, okay, yeah, we need to finish out somehow, don't we? <laughs> yes, okay, fine. Shall we? Chris, you're in charge. You know the words. You will give us the spiel. Cool, nice one. Well, thanks, guys. If you got this far, you you have far stronger patience than I do. <laughs> so thank you for listening to today's episode of the More Than Lifting podcast with myself and my host co-host, Reese Morgan. If you like what you heard, Please subscribe if you haven't done already, and if you haven't equally done already, go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review to help other people find the show. Share it around, give it as a gift for Christmas. People will thank you eventually, and yeah. Otherwise, get in touch with us, reach out. A show like ours is only as good as its audience, so we'd love to hear from you. Any questions, comments, feedback, anything you want to throw at us whatsoever, find us on social media as More Than Lifting or Coach Thatch or head on over to morethanlifting.com and get in touch with us through there. Otherwise, I think that's pretty much everything for today. What do you say, Rick? Yeah, um, that's that's it, guys. Um, you know, reach out to us if you've got anything to say. If you're interested in the program, check it at morelifting.com slash 28 transformation. Love, 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 guys. Keep in touch with yourselves and I'll catch up with you next week. Bye.